Good morning, good afternoon, good evening everyone Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show Episode number 154 Uno, cinco, cuatro With me, Agostino Zynga How you doing, how you feeling, motherfuckers? Hope you're doing well and I'm doing fine And you're well hydrated, well rested and all that malarkey I'm feeling amazing as per usual um, this morning did not start out with a workout in case you're wondering what my morning routine is and if it's changed from any other day that I've done a podcast, but it hasn't today. Well, it has changed because today there was no morning workout today. There'll be an evening run. I don't really like work, running in the evening. Like I mentioned a few times, I have to do this. No, I don't really like it, but you know, because, um, my eyesight isn't the best even in the daylight. So when you include the nighttime and I having to run on a curb and shit, I usually stack over, hit my face on the floor, which isn't the most funnest thing to go through, but needs must, needs must. So yeah, here I am back in, back in Stratford town, speaking to you lovely people. And yeah, got a lot to talk about, man. Got a lot to go through. Got loads of stuff on the list that I haven't gone through in the last couple of days. I've been meaning to go through because I end up rattling on about my week that no one cares about. But that aside, we're back and live and direct. Here we go. On top of saying anything else before we move on, I've actually uh, secured another DJ date for Saturday the 9th. Is it 9th? I think Saturday's the 9th, right? Am I am I all right or am I going crazy? Saturday the 9th, yeah. Saturday the 9th, I'm DJing at the Jago. If you're wondering what the Jago is, the Jago is the bar or pub that used to be Passing Clouds. Passing Clouds was kind of like one of the most um, um, interesting spots to go to, I think, on a Dawson Strip. It used to kind of be mostly programmed around like um, dub, around reggae, around afro beats like a really kind of cool alternative space sometimes they'd have live performances sometimes they'd have djs sometimes they'll have plays in there it was really cool interesting spot and unfortunately due to all the rising costs i think in rent for the most part the people behind the parts and clouds decided to kind of not renew it or something happened along. i don't i don't really know the details i do remember there being a protest i remember there being a bit of a fundraiser but ultimately they couldn't kind of see it through and uh, luckily during that whole process, it seemed like they were going to knock down the building because it's in a pretty prime spot. If you're wondering where it was, it's right next door to, um, oh, what's, what's it called? Fuck, I haven't been there in ages, isn't it? What's that, what's that bar called? Haggerston. Yeah, it's right next, it's kind of a couple of rows down up on the Haggerston, which is like right on the Dawson Strip. It's a bit away from the main road, so it's a little bit more quiet. So I was one, I was thinking, I think as most people kind of safely assume that they were going to knock it down and turn it into flats. But somehow they haven't. And now it's going to be turned into another pub, I mean, another bar called the Jago uh, with a similar kind of programming behind it. And I think they've got some of the people involved with Grow and Hackney. If you've been to Grow and Hackney, which is along the canal, it's kind of the, it's kind of a carried on the spirit of the passing clouds with some similar kind of performances. They have a lot of kind of um, cool promoters on um, while working with them. We put on some interesting nights. I think the other night they had like a really cool kind of uh, Italian hip hop thing going on at the, at the Grow and Hackney, which looked pretty interesting. They've always got some interesting programming going on there. So they've got the guys involved in that and they're going to do some of the programming at the Jago. And I've been lucky enough to get secure a spot during their kind of open decks night. That's going to happen on the Saturday. So that should be cool. I'm not sure what time we're going to play. Um, I'm assuming maybe a bit later. They mentioned I might play later. So I'll have some details on that later. But for now, I'm fully booked for the weekend in Dawson, right? Which is a fucking weird turn up for the books, right? Considering... I guess, you know, was here, uh, left alone in Stratford and Leightonstone, right? Dis uh, disregarded, right? Chucked to the side of the road, told, hey, there you go, fester over there. And now look, I'm back on my own terms, back without sucking a single peeny. And here I am playing twice back-to-back uh, uh, -back in Dawson. What a time to be alive. And then I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Saturday, I probably might head off to fold after I finish my set. Because uh, uh, Peter Petrescu, Peter Petra Petrescu from uh, IRAP, you know the kind of um, you know those really famous Romanian DJs that came up during kind of the early two thousands when Ricardo Villalobos was really coming coming to fruition, coming into uh, his own at that time. There was a bunch of DJs coming up at the same time um, that were coming from the Romania scene. Uh, who kind of followed a little bit of his mold, kind of copied his mannerisms and stuff like that. But those kind of guys are really cool. I saw them play a few times when I was... No, I saw them play once, actually, at Robert Johnson when I went to Frankfurt a few years ago. I saw them play there, and they're going to be playing again, I think, this weekend. I think so, am I sure, this weekend? I'm pretty sure it's this weekend. Let me double-check. But I'm definitely... I think I'm probably going to go to Fall this weekend for that. 
let me see if I can see on my phone here. Yeah, there we go. Into the woods with uh, Petra in in Inspirescu. I think you pronounce it right. Inspirescu. Yeah. So that's gonna be unfold from ten till seven in the morning. So probably gonna finish my set. Uh, the Jago will probably head over to there for a little boogie or two. So pretty jam packed weekend, all in. But anyway, enough about that. Enough about our weekend. Enough about all that malarkey. Because who gives a flying fuck? Let's get into the nice juicy topics that we got here to talk about. Because there's so much to get into that I want to kind of run through. Number one, number one, number one on the list. I'm not sure if I mentioned this previously or if it came up in another podcast. But um, there's an interesting documentary coming up that uh, a few people are putting together that concentrates on the Berlin bouncer. Um, as you guys know, I am absolutely infatuated with Berlin. It's my kind of spiritual home. I think as the more I've grown up, the more I've started to realize, the more the more I've grown up and the more I've kind of matured and started to maybe realize that um, I was maybe chasing fun instead of kind of allowing fun to come to me or being present in the fun that I was currently in. So maybe uh, Berlin isn't as um, as much of a prize as it was for me in the past. I think the last couple of trips I went to Berlin, I kind of realized quite quickly that I can do the same thing in Berlin I can do here in London. Obviously not to the same sort of degree, obviously not to the same sort of level of kind of carefreeness, obviously to the same sort of level of spontaneity, but the similar sort of elements kind of run through London. But um, essentially what you have to do is kind of allow yourself to be present and not be kind of, you know, infatuated with what you're missing out on or or kind of comparing to another place. You just can't be like love, loving it for what it is. It's sort of like when you go to... Uh, Weatherspoons, or you go to like a random shitty pub somewhere or a shitty bar in a random town and you have the best time ever why it's because you're allowing yourself to be present in that moment with whoever you're with and really enjoying the ambience and whatever happens happens so i've kind of had the same sort of realization with berlin but still you know there's aspects about berlin especially if you're if you're found in that life like i am and you love underground music and you love uh club culture then you just can't ignore you can't help but ignore just how um, just how on point Berlin has everything when it comes to club culture, right? They've just got it. They've got it figured out from the fact that the government helps clubs uh, in uh, soundproof their clubs so it can, you know, so they can stay around the residential areas. From the fact that the government works hand in hand in making sure the clubs are safe environments to the fact that the clubs take an active responsibility or active role in ensuring that they have the right kind of people in their clubs by having pickers and by having bouncers that know the people, right people to come in there. They get everything completely spot on when it comes to um club culture and none more so than the aspect of bouncers right um if you're if you're familiar with the bouncers in london bouncers in london usually kind of are de facto security guards by the most part right they don't really that they, well they're bouncers by their conventional sense right they're basically there to kind of maintain the peace so if anyone gets too rowdy they chuck them out if someone's too drunk they don't let them in but that's about their remit where it stops right but for the most part it's not really their fault the bouncers but you know with the with the kind of draconian licensing laws we have and the fact that most bars and clubs have to shut before 2 or 3 a.m it means that um for the most part people come out or to have a good and, and plus added it added add to the fact that most people in, in the uk start drinking very early on in the evening because you know they want to get their bang for their buck it adds to a very um temperamental and a very unpredictable clubbing landscape right so on any given night you might be in a club full of like you know really heavily intoxicated people another time it might be completely quiet but bar owners and bar managers and whatever they may be cannot afford to have people not in their bar not paying an entrance fee not paying six pound for a pint so what ends up happening is that bouncers and cup door pickers end up being a lot more lenient on the door and letting more people in because they don't have that much time left in order to kind of get their money into the till which then leads to a very dysfunctional dance floor and leads to a very questionable um, actions happening on the dance floor whether it's people getting sexually assaulted whether people getting involved in fights whether it's people getting pickpocketed just because the doors are open and everyone kind of allowed it if you have money it kind of fucks it up whereas berlin on the other side they don't have any of that they don't have the they don't have the table service culture that we maybe have a little bit in the uk which is not really prevalent anymore for the most part but they don't really have that table service culture at all in berlin so because of that they have a they don't and because they have such a uh, long opening hours most bars and clubs most standard bars like you know the bars you see in shoreditch and dawson they close at four all of the standard kind of like you know quintessential kind of trendy bars that are in kreuzberg they close at 4 a.m and then the other bars that are just like five minutes up the road or a little bit you know underground they can go on for as long as 10 in the morning sometimes even one right so they can go on as long as they want to so what you're seeing is that there's a less um, proclivity to kind of go out and get super smashed because you know you're going to be out until four having a chat with your friend in a nice um dimly lit uh, bar somewhere in the middle of in the middle of uh, Berlin with some cool furniture in it and shit like that 
And also, the bouncers and the door pickers take an active responsibility into ensuring they have the right people in their club. Like, if you have money in Berlin, you, it doesn't mean you're going to get in. Just because you can pay the entry fee doesn't mean they're going to let you in. You just have to, dem- you have to kind of, it's weird how you have to, you have kind of have to somehow showcase that you kind of get it and they kind of have to feel that you're going to get it when you go in there. And what ends up happening is that people inside end up kind of having a safe space where they can really party, really let their hair down, really have a good time. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that a lot of the clubs founded in Berlin are kind of come from the gay culture scene and the gay culture scene has kind of, you know, they've been kind of targeted with violence in some cities it may be. So they might take a bit more care in ensuring that their patrons who kind of established the club are in a safe environment. Maybe it has to do with the fact that a lot of the clubs are working hand in hand in the government and they don't want to fuck it up. So they can't allow any chances. They can't allow like a group of like seven guys to come in and have a tear up but whatever it is whatever the reasons may be the end product is when you go into most bars and clubs in berlin especially the good ones it's nine times out of ten you're gonna have a good time like nine times out of ten you're gonna have a great fucking time um the people that go in there are already very appreciative of getting let in because obviously there's a there's like a barrier of entry right there's like a it's like 50 50 of whether you're gonna get in or not so when you do get in you're gonna be in your best behavior the responsibility to be kind of like um to have all your you know to have all your senses in order not to be too fucked up is with you too you can't allow yourself to get too fucked up in a nightclub because you know they're going to remember and not gonna let you in again there's a lot of like social responsibility around the people around you they make sure they look after you i've seen plenty of times i've been in berlin clubs where a guy or girl has got a bit too crazy or got a bit too fucked up and there's been a random guy or girl in there kind of helping them out uh, running them through processes or there might be someone on site there that can help with with um, uh, harm reduction and all that sort of stuff like really great culture and all to, all to do with it but like I said the epicenter the people that are kind of at the mainstay and they're important and that kind of really um, hold the places together are the bouncers and they've got this amazing documentary which I'm going to play here uh, this documentary is going to come out very soon. Um, it's an article here featured on Electronic Beats. I'm going to quickly read through the article. So it says here, da, 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 a new documentary directed by David Diet seeks to go deeper into the lives and histories or in working practices of three of German's capital's most famous dolmen. Berlin Bouncers told the story of Sven from Ber- Bergheim, as we know, uh, Smiley Baldwin, b- both of whom have been working at Bergheim, as well as uh, Frank Kunster, who uh, is in the 90s worked at the Delicious Donuts. Uh, uh, the film details each figure's passion to club culture with their varied origins. Um, Baldwin was an American GI guard in the Berlin border. Kunster sought out the capital in the West. And uh, Sven from Bergheim was a budding photographer. And I think, I think it was before I went to... Now, I think the pictures have got taken down. I remember I went to Berlin. I went to Bergheim a couple... Uh, I've said Berlin. Uh, <laughs> people say, but I went to Bergheim a couple years ago. And I remember there being massive posters on the, on the stairs as you go up of all the people that work at Bergheim and the pictures were taken by Sven, like crazy pictures of them holding like these flame things in their hands. It was fucking cool. But anyway, let's quickly watch this trailer for this documentary. It's called uh, Berlin Bouncer Trailer and it's going to come out on February 10th, 11th and 16th as part of the Berlin Biani, uh, the Berlin Biani Film Festival and then it's going to have a wide release on April. So I'm hoping, hoping some venues in London um, be able to screen this and if i if not i'm gonna try and get in contact with the guys myself and see if i can get it screened in a bar or a club somewhere around here but let's quickly play this and get it on it's not possible that is not possible. Oh, you've got some bums in a way, but that is not possible. Is a fucking quintessential uh, Berlin response in it, right? How many times have you been to Berlin and you heard someone say it's not possible? Not tonight. Like, ah. But again, like I said, it's so cool because the next time you come around, you got your shit in order, right? If you have to fucking dress up to get in, if you have to make sure you don't drink anything to get in, like that's the most sober and the most clear headed I've been clubbing and I had the best time and I remembered all the sets who've played. You know sometimes you go out in London and you go to a bar or a club or a nightclub and you go to hear a DJ play and you don't even remember who the fuck it was, right? Because you got so hammered beforehand. Every time I've been to Berlin, whoever I've seen, I've remembered their set. I've remembered even songs they fucking play. That's how, you know what I mean? Because already when before you go to these bars and clubs, you, you, you want to get in. So the last thing you're going to do is fucking pre-drink till your eyes go red. You're going to kind of get yourself in, in state. You're going to be calm, be chilled. Plus, after you've been a few times, you don't want to be the guy walking on the street holding a, a bottle of beer. It's a little bit cliche. You want to go in, you want, you want to walk around and, and look like you're a fucking local, even though you're not, and you stick out like a sore thumb. But still, you're on your best behavior before you get in. And then you're just hoping, hoping you don't get not tonight. Or it's not possible. But anyway, let's continue. <laughs> Man malt jeden Abend ein Bild. Es ist dann gelungen, dass alle beim Losgehen sagten, geile Leute, geile Mucke, geile Schuhe. No idea what they're saying, but you know, Frank Kunstler. Das ist wirklich ein absurder Beruf. 
Ich bin Exzessbetreuer und deshalb schenke ich mir die Weise bei positiv Aufmerksamkeit. War das awesome. Also ich mal die drin. Diese steife, trockene. Oh, Roses. This is my favorite, one of my favorite bars and clubs in Berlin. It's called Roses. I think it's, I think it's in Kreuzberg. It's amazing. It's a really like like most uh, bars and clubs in Berlin. It's a bit kitschy. Vibe. Is it? Is it I'm sure it's called Roses. I'm sure it's Roses, but it's a bit um, kitschy. Let me see if I can quickly get it up on here. It's a bit kitschy, and it's got like a uh, felt pink interior on the inside, um, and loads of weird kind of accoutrements everywhere. Berlin Bar. Let's see. Is it Roses? I'm sure it's Roses, right? Is it Roses? Yeah, Roses. That's the one. Yeah. It's Roses. It's in... I don't even know what that area is called, actually. I'm not even going to pronounce her name. But yeah, it's a bar called Roses. It's a. It's a, supposedly meant to be a gay bar, but the times I've been in there, I've not had... They don't really have DJs or anything playing in there, but, you know, it's a pretty cool, kitschy bar. One ro one small door uh, stairs leading up to it. The entirety of the club's interior is kind of pink, fur, felt kind of vibe. Um... Is it, is it Kreuzberg? It is Kreuzberg, right? The area says, is it Kreuzberg? It's near kind of Alexanderplatz or Kort sorry. It's near Kort So that kind of area, I don't sure that's Kreuzberg. I think that's another area, but anyway. Yeah, so that area, it's, it's near Kort Station. It's a really cool bar. Um, It's got a tiny bar. It's got a tiny bar actually inside it. Most of it's kind of made up of tables and chairs everywhere with loads of little weird uh, mobiles hanging down from the ceiling. It's one of my favorite places to go. It's the kind of place that you go to if you just want to come and go there and meet randoms, especially times I've been there on my own. It's best time to kind of meet some strangers to go out and party with later. And, you know, Berlin's the best place to kind of meet strangers to go out and have a good time so um, that's the youngs we sollten halt spaß haben bei der arbeit du bist die oberste mit der die dort besten fall hat der das wenn so, der burger ein dude der pocher irgendwie spuren hinterlassen oder leute geprägt und ein lebensgefühl ausgemacht ich glaube alle oder jeder den es betraf muss erst mal lernen was freiheit überhaupt noch bedeuten kann und die leute haben diese plätze besetzt diese häuser besetzt und das like it'll be heavy on the history too lots of stuff about the berlin war which was great Clubszene eingetaucht und es waren so Orte, die wow. ich als total wieder Das looks fucking cool, man. I can't wait. Ich wusste schon zwei Wochen, nachdem ich in Berlin war, da stimmt irgendwas. Und daneben, dass halt so viele interessante Menschen sich da treffen. Oh ich yes. finde es ganz großartig, dass immer wieder neue Läden aufmachen. Ich finde es genauso tragisch, dass andere wieder zumachen, aber auch das gehört irgendwie mit dazu. Uh, that looks quite cool, a t-shirt, wouldn't it? That Berlin bouncer Dina? on the t-shirt. That looks pretty cool. Then come I bestimmt in so eine Hieronymus Bosch Zwischenhölle, <laughs> wo ich immer irgendwo klopfe That's und uh, die sagen, nee, du nicht. Yeah. Nee, he loves a bit of nee, doesn't he? Fucking fucking today loves a bit of knee but yeah that looks really cool and it's just awesome really to see isn't it right imagine being a bouncer in berlin as a whole career you end up being this famous dude on the internet someone like me speaks about you for fucking 10 minutes right that's an amazing thing isn't it it's that's what that, that's that's the thing as well i wish london would do because it's such a as expensive as a city as it is i think you can't complain like even this place i'm djing at the weekend the jago it's a really cool, like, you know, little alternative space. It's kind of, you know, African, Caribbean influence. It's a bit different in terms of programming. It doesn't really have the same views as every other place it has. There's so many just spots you can find everywhere. There's indie spots, there's metal spots. But it's just the fact that we have so many limits on where clubs can open, how long they can open for, and the industry isn't taken as seriously as it should be taken, right? It contributes so much to the overall kind of, um, what, what do you call it? The overall um, revenue of a city, right? Nightlife culture, nightlife economy. But it's not respected as, as it should be. And in Berlin, it seems like it's really respected. It's an actual industry where bouncers can actually have a, that can be their career, right? Where if you're, I'm assuming if you're a really well-known bartender, you can probably have a great career in, um, or you're a great barman or a bar woman working in Berlin, you can have a great career too. You can probably move around from club to club. There's bars all over the city you can work at. Like you can actually make good money and have a career doing the thing that you love, working in the industry that you really love and appreciate. And of course, the cost of living in Berlin isn't high either. So, you know, for the most part, you can probably get away with working three days a week or four days a week and, you know, and just living like a rat probably and just still having a, a good life. And, you know, we don't really have that same thing here which is a bit um annoying a bit concerning and again like i said uh bouncers here in london have their workload is fucking insane man they're having to fucking break up fights you know make sure girls are not getting assaulted and shit it's insane and that all because you know there's so many it's too open 
let, you can allow anyone and anyone to come into bars and clubs. We've seen a bit of a different reaction with the promoters like Into the Woods, the Origins night that they, they do at Mixed Garage, which I'm a big fan of. They take a really... Um, they take a real big uh, step responsibility to make sure the people inside the club are cool. Even the listings you go on Facebook when they kind of put the events up, they're always saying there's always a disclaimer there. We have the right to refuse entry. They've kind of seen that as great as it is to have your night be sold out, have it full. You'd much rather have the right people in there than have the wrong people in there. But you know, over time, hopefully these kind of actions and these kind of um, practices can kind of seep their way through to kind of cities like London, and we can kind of maybe see a bit more of a sea change in the kind of overall clubbing culture. But that documentary looks fucking awesome and i can't wait to check it out uh, like i said berlin bouncer it's going to be due out on february the 10th 11th 16th uh, as part of the berlin Bilani, if you're there but then i think it's going to come wider release on april and again if, it, if it's not featured or if it's not done if no one in london does it and i don't see any listings i'm going to contact the people that are making a film and see if i can get it uh screened somewhere um and i'll be pretty cool i reckon doing that on my end but yeah um move on move on in what's next on the list here Bish bash bosh. Oh yeah, okay. Um, talking about clubbing. Um, together we dance alone. This is I, sh I should have probably mentioned this earlier on beforehand, but um, one of my favorite DJs, Dixon, has his own clothing line, and he's kind of he spoke about it a little bit in this um little interview that happened. I think a couple of years or maybe a year ago. Is it a year ago? Yeah, last year. He's kind of DJ, which I didn't I didn't know that that the company that he actually so anyway. Dixon is a world famous um techno dj or electronic dj for the most part um was once voted um ra's top dj in the, in the world four years in a row um and kind of rose to prominence and then like suddenly you know because he's an amazing artist and has his own kind of way of thinking he suddenly decided to kind of cut all these gigs and start and and kind of commit to so doing 100 gigs a year and then he's kind of cut it even more i think now in these later years and he's kind of really concentrated on making sure he kind of pushes his own parties that he does uh, with his label innovision but essentially just like you know one of the most seminal and influential djs out at the moment probably a real technician of the craft and also somebody that's a bit of a showman he's kind of just he's different in all aspects from his clothing to his points of view on the industry to how he approaches releases to the people on his label and now he's suddenly kind of branched off into fashion you know he's always been someone's quite fashionable he's kind of the first dj i saw on stage who wasn't wearing rick owens right and and the lamusu and shit like that right he, i think the first time i saw him play i think or the first time i've kind of noticed him i saw him because because i think he was wearing a comme des garçons shirt shirt right and i was like shit okay this is pretty cool and i kind of looked into him and then find that he was just kind of this amazing dj and he's got like a really great history um i think he used to be a former footballer and he kind of had to quit because he hurt his knee he's got a sandwich shop somewhere in frankfurt where he's from um he's just really cool and eclectic dude and now he started his own label um called uh together we dance alone and the uh, premise behind it is a deconstruction of club wear to catch the madness and the sadness of dancing exhilarated but exhausted together but alone like amazing right kind of a, a, a kind of um an extension of kind of anti-social social club right but done in a kind of clothing style and so done in a clubbing environment way and the clothing looks pretty cool for the most part I and mean, i wasn't really paying attention to it previously but i kind of stumbled upon it again and it looks really nice we've got here um we've got the is it launch it says is it that's a launch shirt right so we've got here the together we dance alone launch shirt it looks really cool some nice prints on it some great metal fonts on there all fully stocked on the website which is which is funny to see actually i thought this would have been sold out but yeah it looks really cool it reminds me a little bit of um i forgot what brand it is that does the strings on the end of it i think it's a japanese brand that does like um they make like a font and then there's like strings hanging off of it i forgot what the brand is but yeah um these look really nice great shirt as per usual there's a there's a sakai collaboration which you've been a fan of which i'm not really that fan of to be honest but i know people like it it looks really good on on him wearing it anyway together and again uh and my favorite is probably this long sleeve here which is the the classic is back which is what the classic is back white on black long sleeve with a together with dance initials printed on it yeah this is my favorite tee i think of them all um it's sort of like it's got together with dance on one sleeve it's got the together with dance motif on the front chest and on the back it's got the weird kind of like shadowy figure um standing in the sunlight that looks really cool it comes in black and it comes in white too but yeah a really cool um clothing line that dixon started and he gave a really cool interview as well about it on forbes so i'll link in the show notes he kind of talks about the brand and how he started it with his wife which i wasn't too familiar with about um, his wife is actually the art director of innovisions which is fucking awesome uh his wife's name is uh what's his wife's name da, 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 da. um anna ofak she's an artist and creative director in her own right and she kind of helped out with doing a brand so that looks really awesome um 
How's he mentioned it? How's he started it? Da, 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 da. And it's all, and I, I was wondering because I think all this is to feed into his club events that he's doing. Um, Lost in Sound, which is a really cool way to do things. I think he's done a lot of corporate collaborations, the Louis Vuitton stuff, um, the thing with Gran Turismo or GTA, sorry, where he was in the game and he provided a mix as well for the car, which is awesome. Um, and now he's doing all this merch and stuff. So it looks like he's trying to get as many sponsors, as many streams of income as he can to avoid having to be sponsored by different corporations, right? Which is where the kind of the artistry of the the kind of pure artistry dies. It's the hard balance in that between commerce, between artistry and commerce, right? How to kind of balance it and probably the only way to do it is either to raise your prices, right? To raise your kind of rate as a DJ or to kind of, you know, uh, diversify your income streams to have different revenues, lines of income so that hopefully that can then lend itself to putting on a show because one thing you can't, fault Dixon and Innovision for is taking their foot off the pedal because those Innovision lost in sound parties are insane they put them in really crazy you know, ridiculous locations like Israel and some fucking palace in the middle of France or some shit they caught pick some really interesting places and to kick those places out with a full PA system must be really really difficult to do so I'm really like a big fan of what they're doing and again like I said um, I just think this is probably the best way to kind of get all that money and to kind of have it sponsor uh, parties and events you want to do um so he mentions the kind of inspiration for the line is as follows. Uh, teaming up with my wife was a progression for an appreciation of club culture, discussing his openness and trying to figure out how to communicate his creativity other than through music, which is interesting because I think I mentioned before, like I found it really difficult finding club wear. I think whenever you go to like a proper nightclub, like the times I went to, I went to fold when, no, sorry, I went to Mixed Garage when Pussy Palace was on, right? Pussy Palace is like one of the best kind of queer nights out there, right? They do amazing parties. They kind of host them all over the place. But the last two, the last couple I've been to, I've been at Mixed Garage, right? And they really put on a big production. They smash it. They're amazing. They have a stage show. They have someone voguing. It's really amazing open space for people to go to and have a good time. Um, but one thing that I, what was I going to say? Oh, one thing that I noticed is that when you go to those kind of places, you realize that club wear, for the most part, yeah, club kids, it's the same kind of thing, the outfits. So it doesn't really change. They're cool, they're amazing, but they're probably a little bit too much for me, right? When it comes to harnesses, when it comes to gags, when it comes to fishnet t-shirts, when it comes to uh, latex trousers, when it comes to crotchless pants, right? That's the kind of only the vibe that it appeals to. And for the most part, it's, there's a reason for it, right? Because most of the club culture or club kids wear comes from the idea of showcasing your creativity, you know, um, especially in a gay scene um, on a night out, right? So you'd kind of go a bit crazy, especially the Vogue scene. You'd kind of spend all week saving up money, putting together an amazing outfit, making yourself and then you spend the saturday kind of like showcasing it right and what you did even if you're working out whatever you may be doing right that was a chance for you to kind of show out um but it's not really a kind of medium ground when it comes to club wear and i don't necessarily want to go to a club and always just have a black t-shirt on and jeans right i want to be a little bit you know uh dandy looking right um but there's a kind of a line between like dandy and kind of a little bit ott over the top for my own liking and um i think this is a and i think what dixon's doing with this um a little bit of that together we dance alone line is a good kind of medium ground right because he's he's well known for being a dj that doesn't just wear black so he's always wearing kind of bright colors even the merch they do for their night it's always kind of bright yellows reds oranges like limes he's got the collaboration with sakai which is very bright and very open do you know what i mean like i i can see where the direction is going and i'm hopefully we can kind of see an extension of it and again i think if i was going to do my own collection if i was going to do my own brand i'll do something similar or that kind of ilk right kind of being able to kind of somehow being able to translate what happens on the dance floor into clothing it's very hard to do even to even um to reviewing club nights right resident advisor do an amazing um uh, job at it right if you go and check the events of resident advisor they do a really cool job of kind of reviewing like really cool club nights but it's very difficult to kind of put into words the ambiance and the vibe that happens on that dance floor it's just it's just near and impossible to do so um if if you can kind of get it 10 percent right it really resonates and everyone kind of backs it and i think he's kind of on the right track with this um collection overall um and he continues here, he says, instead of a style, we rather consider it to be a sense or a sensation, like a sensation of catching the madness and sadness of dancing in a club together, but alone, exhilarated but exhausted. See, I love that. That kind of, you know, that that's essentially what it is. It's like, um, what is it called? Um, what's that book? Uh, is it Dancing? No. 
uh, dance into architecture or something like that, right? That, I think that's what it said about reviewing music. That's how hard it may be sometimes. I remember, I think that was a quote, right? Like, review music is like dance into architecture. Um, the label originally lo- released a limited edition uh, long sleeve shirt created in junction with the visual artist Christina Nagel before releasing a long sleeve styled uh, by a Japanese fashion brand, Sakai. The two pole lovers created by Dixon's label that were available in Sakai. Ayama, da, da, da. It's interesting because you're probably going to see a collaboration with Dixon or Innovision with Nike and I think that's coming up very soon. Uh, Sakai is very close with Nike. I know Fraser Cook, who works at Nike, is very close with the uh, founder of Sakai. That's one of his closest friends from the old Japanese scene. Uh, Dixon's always wearing Sakai. I could definitely see a collaboration with Nike coming up in the next few months, if it may be, because I think it looks like he's raising his profile. He's really putting himself out there. He's doing the Louis Vuitton campaign recently. It's soon that Dixon's trying to kind of, you know, branch out a different field. So if you see a collaboration with uh, Nike coming up with Dixon, you know you heard it here first. I've got no inside information. I'm just kind of guessing by the kind of moves he's doing, because Everyone kind of does the same sort of calculate steps to kind of get themselves out there by and large. But yeah, that's a really cool interview. I recommend you check it. Uh, I'll, I'll actually put it in the show notes. It's a short interview anyway. It's from Forbes from 2018. Dixon on his clothing label together we dance alone and appearance in graphic auto five. But I'll just put it in the show notes for those of you that care. Um what else is on here? Da, 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 da. Oh, Travis Scott at the Super Bowl, right? So um Travis Scott decided um, in his infinite knowledge to perform at the Super Bowl, even though the entirety of black Twitter and black culture were telling him not to. Um, the reason being because, of course, uh, most black entertainers are kind of abstaining from supporting the NFL due to the treatment of Colin Kaepernick. Colin Kaepernick, as you know, a few, is it a few, maybe it's a couple of years ago now, isn't it? Maybe it's been a year, maybe it's probably been more than a year. Um, uh, he took a stand against police brutality that was happening, that was kind of springing up in the US. We kind of, it kind of seemed like every other week we'll get another video of a cop being a little bit too physical when it came to um, arresting or kind of questioning uh, black people um, there was a couple of high profile deaths that happened too so in the terms of a protest Colin Kaepernick decided to take the knee oh no I think he, ref- he at first he didn't stand for the national anthem and then I think uh, on the advice of a veteran that he spoke to um, in terms of kind of like what that meant to soldiers that are fighting abroad he decided they came to an agreement that maybe the most respectful thing to do was actually take a knee but you know the US are a bit crazy or a bit super patriotic and they kind of took the whole him taking a knee as a kind of middle finger to the united states and it kind of spiraled into another conversation that had nothing to do with the original intention that colin Kaepernick was doing but essentially you know protests by and large they're meant to disrupt right they're not meant to be friendly they're not meant to fit into a particular kind of mold they're not meant to be like pg they're not meant to be um as you like them protests by their very nature are meant to be uh, disruptive right we're seeing the whole thing coming with the yellow vest people in um, paris or in france by and large right recently i think the other week uh, a yellow vest protester got blinded in one eye one of the main people that was kind of organizing it i think he says he was targeted by the french police and he was shot with the rubber bullet and they blinded him essentially in one eye so we see that effectively like you know act effective protest requires you having to really risk something right in order to kind of make some change and colin kaepernick essentially risked his career because you know nfl um teams quite similar to most te- most kind of professional um, sports outfits in the world don't want any kind of unwarranted or unneeded press or unneeded kind of attention on their team. So they kind of felt an infinite wisdom that he was bringing too much other eyes on their, on their organization. So they dropped him. I don't think, no, I don't think they signed him and then another, another team wouldn't sign him. And again, I'm not an NFL expert, but from what I've heard online, Colin Kaepernick is as good or if not better than a lot of the people that are starting in his position as quarterback, but he wasn't signed by another organization because they don't want to deal with the kind of blowback of having this person on their team and having the kind of you know fox news people go crazy about it so essentially he got he's out of a job now because of the stand he took and because of that hip-hop artists decided you know what we're not going to perform at your show because you know for the most part the nfl is like maybe i don't know 80 percent black anyway so um a lot of the people that um so it's quite synonymous with you know hip-hop culture a lot of people that are in hip-hop support really some of the biggest nfl teams but in order to kind of protest um the fact that you know the nfl teams aren't signing uh, um Colin Kaepernick and the fact that Roger Goodell, the kind of, you know, the main spokesperson or the president of the NFL isn't taking in yet or hasn't really said that much apart from a press conference he had the other day. Everyone kind of abstained from performing there. But Travis Scott decided to go go and do it, right? Which was a bit weird at the first, right? I was like, what's this guy doing? But then if you listen to him in his interviews, you'd see that Travis Scott isn't the most politically aware person out there. I dare, dare, I'll dare to say, which, no, I'm not, not mean to be rude or anything, but he's not the most, you know, he's not the sharpest tool in the box anywhere when it comes to that side of thing. And maybe by and large, you know, he's had a really great, he's had an amazing year. He's had probably one of his best albums to date. He's doing one of the best stage productions you probably see out there with his Astro World tour. Uh, he's married a girl of his dreams. Um, he's got a kid. 
and he's kind of had one of the best years, like a couple of years in his life. So maybe he kind of wanted to really put uh, a period on it and really kind of cap it off by performing at, a, at the Super Bowl, halftime Super Bowl show. And maybe growing up, it was one of the biggest things to him. So even with all the kind of backlash that's happening on social media, he decided to do it anyway. And he read it out pretty well, I think. He didn't really make any comment, um, apart from towards the uh, when it was approaching. I think some of his team leaked that he had spoken to Colin Kaepernick and it came to an agreement. And Colin Kaepernick said unequivocally, no, he didn't speak to me, which then, you know, obviously meant that Travis was maybe lying we don't know what to believe but he read it out pretty well he kind of didn't comment on it and he kind of just did a performance anyway and went but considering the fact that his performance was pretty lackluster i watched it and the sound wasn't good that they kind of fucked him up in that regard it it didn't seem like it was worth all the hassle to perform at the nfl halftime show and added to the fact that when you see his outfit when you see what he fucking wore when you see what he wore you're gonna be like oh my god why the fuck did he even bother and yeah the outfit is um the outfit is interesting to say the least. Um, I'm gonna try and get it up here on the screen. Let me see if I can fit it on here. Da, 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 da. So yeah, um, the outfit is interesting. I'm gonna say. Um, so he's got on. I think it's what? Is it a leaks? Where's it got on? He's got Louis Vuitton by Virgil and a leaks. Um, on right and this is from a, the celebrity advice page one of my favorite pages on instagram and the outfit is shockingly bad he's got the he's got that he's got that louis vuitton piece that um, virgil did for louis vuitton now with a michael jackson line recently uh, across his waist which is i think originally i think it was on the model across the chest he's got this weird kind of leather vest thing on um with a shirt underneath his hat leather trousers and those shitty jordan sevens like oh it's just one of probably one of the worst outfits I've seen Travis when he's always been a bit hit and miss of his with his outfits, but lately he's done a really good job. Um, especially on tour, he's kind of had you know a pretty good run. But I, again, the performance was probably quite dead. The outfit looks shocking, right? And I'm just wondering, like, was it worth all the trouble? Was it worth having people think you're a sellout? Having people kind of question your integrity, having people think that you're selfish and self-centered, which I don't really agree with. I think everyone's got their, you know, their MO. Sometimes he probably just doesn't give a shit. You know, no one's really kicking up a fuss that Big Boy performed, right? No one really cares about that. So I don't know. It's just it's just weird to me. It's just weird to me. All that fuss to go to do the halftime show and you turn up wearing that kind of outfit and you turn up performing the way he did. Um, I just not I just don't understand personally. Um you've got a couple more pictures here uh that kind of illustrate just how bad of an outfit it was overall it just looks shocking he's got like a i think a football glove on um it just doesn't look good simple as that it just does not look good at all um again i'm not too sure what the thinking was behind it personally me no fan again he's had a great year but i just don't know whether it was worth all the trouble to kind of do this again um or to do this anyway in general with everyone kind of saying what they're saying on social but again maybe you shouldn't care right maybe it shouldn't you shouldn't bother what people are going to say and if you think you've you've had a great year and you want to really cap it off in style and you want to perform at a super bowl and it really means a lot to you and i think he's a real big sports fan and whenever i've seen him on the side of the um on the uh, on court side watching a basketball game he's always kind of you know really animated and it whatever jumping all over the place which is cool because most of these celebrities watching those games they're always just sitting there just like let and the time go by and it kind of just seems like another kind of way to kind of market themselves but he kind of really seems passionate about sports so maybe he just didn't give a shit you know fuck it i'm gonna do it i'm gonna take the licks but yeah man questionable that he performed there the outfit is shocking but hey what can you do so that was that what else is on the list move on in move on up ba, 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 ba. oh adam levine at the super bowl Adam Levine from Levine from Maroon Five, the ladies, the ladies' choice, right? He seems to be the kind of de facto guy that girls seem to kind of swoon over. I think, um, by and large, I think most women think he's very attractive man. But yeah, man, taking off your, your shirt to perform in the Super Bowl was a bit weird. He had a weird vest on anyway to begin with. That everyone's taking the piss out of him about, right? You see the vest? I think the vest was like everyone was comparing it to uh, a pillow, which was really funny. I thought for the most part. <laughs> Um, I think, yeah, I think this is the vest, right? Is it here? Yeah, I've got the vest here. So people are putting like, pictures of them, random pillows that kind of look like Adam Levine's vest, which is one thing. Uh, number two, he had a pretty cool choker, I thought, on that looked quite amazing. Um, you don't really see um, white artists wearing this because it's a trend now in, you know, in hip-hop artists for the most part have these kind of like, you know, diamonded chokers on, which probably have made, did Louis Uzi Vert make them famous? I think or maybe Louis Uzi, maybe Playboy Carti made them kind of more famous, like, similar to the kind of chain I have, but a little bit more, you know, closer to your neck. 
um, really big Cuban links kind of choker wise that like taken you know what I mean uh, shortened in length by the most part you know if you remember the kind of chains that Pharrell used to wear back in the day they were really long but for the most part everyone's kind of wearing shorter chains and yeah the chain that he has on looks really cool I gotta be honest and he is bodied up and I think number one the tattoos are fucking stupid right I'd say right I'd say anyone that has a a tattoo of California across their abdomen when they're from there is a bit weird. I never understood that. It's like the skeptic tattoo he's got on his back of his own name. It's just really strange to me. I know people do that, whatever. The tattoos look quite cool, like even though they're, they're a bit, you know, played out, you know, because you know what he's trying to go for. Um, he's bodied up, which is one thing, right? I think he's probably, he probably has the most achievable celebrity male body that girls like out there i think for the most part because you know guys are like weird when it comes to male bodies right um we're kind of always looking at i don't know the kind of the crossfit dude or the rock or somebody really kind of obscene that you're never gonna be able to achieve that kind of level of performance for the most part right but i think adam levine has kind of maybe the most achievable one because it's like you know it's like an average guy's body if you work out if you work out and you take care of yourself and you've got that kind of slim kind of figure in the first place you can kind of achieve it but i think bodies like the rock bodies like i don't know um john cena or those kind of dudes it's just a you know obviously you're gonna need roids and secondly it's just kind of too hard to kind of do day in day out for the most part it's like the bodies they had in 300 the movie right um, but I think Adam Levine's body is probably the most achievable for all the guys out there that want to do it. Because all you need to do this is, is kind of lay off the carbs, get on the cardio, do loads of strength training, a lot of body weight exercises. And you can probably look at that within six months. It's not that difficult to do. And I think this is the body that girls tend to like. You know when, girl, you know when boys... You know when girls say, oh, no, I'm not really into guys in muscles. You know, usually it's lies, right? It's, they're chatting out their ass. But secondly... They don't really probably like the overly um, aggressively muscular guy because, you know, sometimes a girl that has... Because I know I've spoken to girls whose boyfriends are like professional footballers or boyfriends are involved in the fitness industry and they fucking hate it, right? Because for the most part, their boyfriends can't take them out to dinner because they're always on a diet. They can't go out because they don't drink because they have to watch their fucking macros. It's, prob it's quite exhausting for a female to be, you know, with somebody who's profession is to look ridiculously good naked it's really hard to do because you know you can't just do the things that you know girls like to do just hang out have fun do whatever you know what normal people would like to do quote unquote but this kind of body you can do a couple of cheat days right and it's not going to affect you right you can kind of lay off the beer and then you drink tequila or fucking whiskeys and you can kind of achieve the look he has it's quite achievable but i don't think but again i don't think it's as blockbustery as some of the looks that people have and again i think maybe the tattoos kind of help his kind of overall look but it's kind of weird isn't it in general right that he's performing in the super bowl halftime show and all of a sudden he's shot off why is his top off i kind of see it similar to the is it um to the guys that do crossfit and always have their top off it's just strange it's like oh i'm getting really sweaty like just wear a t-shirt or wear a vest why do you have to have your top off it's just strange i never really i never really got it but i think it's just like a style thing or maybe it's quote unquote it's a california thing right the guy with the backwards hat wearing the oakley's topless like doing fucking um uh uh power power cleans and all that sort of malarkey there's a particular kind of guy that does that sort of thing running down the hollywood boulevard but again i'm not i just don't understand it i don't get why he's taking his top off but again not mad at it i think if you've got that kind of body and you've got wearing the jewels that he's wearing and you've got the tattoos you're doing then fuck it let's get the girl swooning but it was quite funny seeing him do it um yeah i think he had a pink guitar on as well i think he was performing with a pink guitar with that weird vest on and there was a bit where he kind of took his top off he kind of smiled at the crowd and said yeah i'm gonna get your panties wet and just took off his top like absolute bad man and it's i think there's something about guys who know they're sexy right and do that which guys kind of get turned off of i don't know what it is about us guys when we when there's a boy in your crew who obviously knows he's sexy and plays up to it we kind of it kind of rubs it up the wrong way i'm not sure why you kind of have to play it down even though when you know even though you know you're the fucking prize in a group you kind of have to kind of act a bit humble about it whereas i think with girls for the most part when they have a sexy friend they always have you know they fucking love it they're taking pictures of them they're showing them off and shit they're usually um they're fucking um de facto bodyguard any guy that tries to talk to them the fucking ugly friend steps up is like no you cannot pass right always fucking no we have to go home together they're always making sure they're staying at their house so they have to go home together so the guy the girl can't bring home a guy it's very strange but in the boys group it's not the same dynamic and you can't be the sexy dude in your group 
you can be sexy, but you can't wear it like, you know, like a fucking, like a medal. You have to kind of be a bit humble about it. And you're like, oh, you know, you know, I'm, I'm sexy, but I'm not that sexy. I mean, you kind of have to like talk about it in whispery tones, but think about yourself. How many groups of girls have you seen with a really smoke show in a group and, you know, the other girls just kind of, you know, just look at her all doughy eyed and everything she says is right. They'll giggle at her jokes. They'll take a million pictures of her in the toilet and shit. It's fucking weird. But again, Adam Levine, big up yourself with your choker on and your tattoo of the location of where you're born bit weird but hey i understand man you got to do what you got to do to get the ladies on side in it even though it's a super bowl i'm not sure how many ladies were actually watching but you know hey what do i know um what else is on the list here let's get rid of trav ba, 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 ba. oh the flu fire smacked it though they actually smashed it performance wise if you didn't see them perform it was fucking awesome i'm not gonna play any of it because i'm sure they're gonna fucking um copy or copyright strike me but i'll put the link of the of the clip that you can go watch the food fights perform in the show description so you can see it it's i think a two or three hour concert they did loads of covers one of my favorite covers they did um they did fucking uh black sabbath war pigs Dun, 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 with a uh, Zach Brown performing on lead, like fucking amazing. Um, again, rock and roll has taken a bit of a backseat these last few years, especially in America, because um, hip hop has kind of rose to prominence and become like, the number one uh, music genre in the world by the most part. And rock bands are not as what they were as before. Loads of kids coming up now, they probably want to be rappers or want to be solo stars. No one wants to be in a band anymore, and maybe there's too much work involved in it. Whatever it may be, like the allure of rock bands has kind of subsided, hence why we're seeing the resurgence of bands from yesteryears, like, Ra- Ra- like the Vampire Weekend, um, uh, Arctic Monkeys, The Strokes, uh, The Killers. All these people are coming back into vogue now at the moment, right? Um, but you're not really seeing a lot of new bands coming up that are really smashing or really going fucking to the nth degree. But, you know, you can't fucking mess around with the Foo Fighters. You know I mean, one of the best bands of all time. They did an amazing kind of set with covering loads of really core cool and influential covers. Um, what else they did? They did um, they did Under Pressure by Queen. Dun, 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 dun. Um, yeah, loads of really good um, things. Um, again, I recommend you check out Alone for the War Pigs, a Black Sabbath cover. Um, I think it was one of the best uh, performances I saw. And that was a pre-Super Bowl performance too. They absolutely smashed that arena to pieces, man. That was really great live performing. Um, I saw that. Um, anyway, moving on in. DMX announces a tour, which I'm sure isn't a good idea, in my opinion. Uh, DMX just recently got released from prison. Um, and he seems like he's in a better space. But again, I'm sure this probably has a lot more to do with the fact that, you know, he kind of needs to make some money. Having been in prison for so long, um, he can't, the best way to kind of get some cash in your pocket um, is to kind of go on tour. Um, I'm sure that's probably the reason why he's doing it for the most part. He probably hasn't got new material out. Even though I remember hearing Swiss Beats say that his album was finished, right? You remember that? There was a period where Swiss Beats said, oh, yeah, his album's done. We're just waiting on to, to finish a few pieces. So that maybe you might hear an album. Maybe this might be off the back of that. He might be able to kind of... Um, kind of you know drum up some interest in the album and kind of get people talking about him but i don't know if this is the right idea right now if he should be like concentrating on performing on stage right now again i'm not against it i think everyone knows or everyone's everyone should be familiar with the amazing performance um that uh dmx did i think was it was it woodstock i think it was woodstock right where he's on stage and he's performing to i don't know five thousand people in the arena i don't know how many people it was um a lot of people right and they don't necessarily all look like dmx fans but he has a crowd in the fucking palm of his hands and he absolutely rips it to pieces and one of the rare live sets on, um, that you hear of rest of the years where he's actually rapping right he's actually like there's no backing track he's just actually spitting over an instrumental and just tearing that place apart just him on his own no crazy dancing no crazy pyrotechnics just absolutely killing it and then you got to see oh wow there's a difference right it's like when you go and see all the old people all the old kind of hip-hop acts perform like i don't know most Def, wu-tang clang you start to realize why these guys are legends, right? Because there's a they they you you like them even more when you see them perform live. Where some of the newer kids coming up nowadays, you hear them on a on a track on a on a, on a track or on an album, you like what they're doing, and you go see them perform live, and all suddenly you know they kill your expectation. They they kind of you know they fail to live up to your expectations because they don't really perform live because you just have the song playing in the background with the vocals. They're just kind of screaming over it, and it's just like it's insane. Or they act like they're on hype, man, right? Which is kind of weird. But DMX was probably one of the rarest kind of like you know form in that regard because he's old school like that because he can actually perform live um it seems like he's doing uh it's a lot it's a lot of dates man it's a lot of fucking dates it's the 20th, 20th, 20th anniversary tour of his album it's dark and hell is not and hell is hot um it's all over the u.s i'm assuming no no nothing in europe so far but i'm sure when he's able to kind of travel abroad he probably will do it but again 
Um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping everything goes as planned. I think he leaves on March, right? 8th of March, Albuquerque. Um, and then it ends at Pittsburgh on the 5th, right? So that's May. Shit, it's a long time. He's, try- he's touring for three months straight. But anyway, yeah, hopefully it goes well for him. Um, he does- if anyone deserves a little bit of upset, to- uptake and success after these kind of turbulent times, DMX does. And I'm sure his team, people around him, are probably going to be able to do a good job about it. If-, if it was me, I probably wouldn't have him performing so soon. But, you know, I'm assuming, you know, he's probably needed the money. He probably needs to kind of get out there and do what he does best, really. He kind of, you know, he's a talented artist in general. So hopefully that goes well for our man, DMX. <sighs> What else is next here on the list? Du, 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 Let's see what we have here. Um, oh, Joe Biden VD game. Um, I'm sure people have seen this by now. I'm not going to get any of the clips up because I don't want to give the game any sort of unnecessary exposure or something that's a bit, you know, cringy. But the game has had a bit of a, it's had a bit of a weird rollout or, you know, a kind of normal rollout if you're the game where he's kind of, you know, released clips of him in the studio where he's kind of talking about, you know, fucking Kim Kardashian supposedly and other people's wives and all that sort of stuff and doing the thing he was naming people, but he's going to be extreme in terms of kind of the Ghana interest. And now it kind of has kind of come to light that maybe there's a track out there that he's going to put out um, relating to Joe Budden's fiance since Antenna, supposedly they were romantically involved a few years ago before Joe got with her. And now he's kind of airing, airing out the dirty laundry. But to make things even... If that wasn't worse, I think now some white 100 or some people in his management are kind of threatening that if anyone kind of contests, if anyone kind of says that what Game is saying is false, then Game is supposedly willing to kind of release a sex tape or video or material evidence to kind of prove that he was indeed um, smashing these women. Which is kind of, you know, obs- disgusting in the most part for the women involved because, you know, no one wants people to put business out there. And it's strange because in hip-hop, it seems like the people putting everyone's business out in terms of who they're sleeping with is usually the guys, right? Whether it's them being sloppy, not wearing protection and getting loads of girls pregnant and then have, and then kind of ghosting them, right? Which is, I've never really understood how that works, how you can get someone pregnant and think you can ghost them when you're a celebrity, right? It's, it's not going to work, right? Especially when a woman feels like she's been left alone or she's been left to make look like, oh, you've been, you, you feel like you've been made to look like a slut. I don't think that's going to go down well. Um, so for the most part it happens that way or just by pillow talking right guys it seems like in that industry or in America in general seem to have like a real Achilles heel in terms of how they deal with women um, so that seems that's not cool secondly as well is somebody's fiance right there should, there's kind of like an unwritten bro code that if someone is in a relationship the last thing you should be doing is reminding that person that they're with that you kind of run through them first or whatever you happen because you know that should be kept secret between the both of you. And, you know, even if the guy knows, I don't think, even if guys know, right, that you probably smashed somebody that they might know, they don't want to know, right? You're not going to sit down and sit your girlfriend and say, oh, yeah, you know, were you this guy? Yeah, was it good? Was it better than me? You're not going to do that. Guys don't want to have that in their head or whatever. And you don't want to be comparing your fucking sex game with somebody else. That's not something guys would want to do. So by and large, doing what he's doing is quite a fem- not even a feminine trait because females don't even do it, right? Women in general don't necessarily put their business out there. There might be a couple women that have done tell-all books, but for the most part, even in tell-all books, they don't really say names, right? They usually kind of keep it hush-hush, throw hints out there, a lot of misdirections, so no one actually knows what's happening. And in general, you know, it's not something that everyone should be privy to, man. It's your, per- it's your personal private business. Well, why should anyone know your business? But of course, the game's out here doing what he's doing, but the one thing I'm happy about is the way that Joe Budden dealt with it for the most part in his podcast. He kind of was quite measured in his response. He really kind of spoke about how sad he feels about how the game, he feels that the game is having to do this because nowadays, you know, you know, he's live even as, as well regarded as we as hip hop fans are of the game. And we think he's an incredible artist with the general public, you know, ever since the G unit days, he probably hasn't reached the same level of, of success. Right. He probably has never really lived up to that kind of, you know, early billing of kind of being one of the biggest stars in the world. And maybe it's part of his own fault because he hasn't necessarily, um, you know, been active as others people have in terms of the press and the media or maybe whatever. Maybe everyone's moved on. But by and large, the game hasn't really kind of reached his potential for the most part. And now with the resurgence of all these new artists coming through, it feels like he's having to do crazy marketing campaigns or techniques or approaches in order to kind of garner the attention that he wants. And unfortunately, now he's kind of using other people's names in order to kind of garner the attention that he wants. And he's not only dealing with his artistry. And like I mentioned before about the girl that had the fake Harry Styles tattoo on her face. Some people say it's genius. Some people would say it's idiotity because now you've kind of turned people off immediately. Right. For me, I'm never going to listen to what she has to put out again just because of the, the fucking stunt. Secondly, the people that are now interested are going to be like, oh, you know what? Let me check out your music. If you don't hit the ground running and release like two, three, four 
um, amazing tracks, automatically the attention for you d- drops completely. So there might be a spike on your Google Trends or people are talking about you, and then it will kind of completely drop off because your work isn't going to be good enough to sustain the interest. And it kind of feels like Joe Budden, I mean, kind of feels like the game is doing the same sort of thing. He's not, he's not cognitive enough. He's not aware enough that as much as this will gain him the viral media he wants on Shade Room and all those kind of places, for the actual people that like music, for the most part, we're going to be like, oh, that's a crazy said that. We're going to listen to a track once and then we're not going to listen to it again. It's going to be one of those things, right? No one is, it's like you kind of have to, you kind of have to move on really quickly and kind of drop music. Now, the word is, I think Rory mentioned it from the Joe Biden podcast, the word is that outside of those kind of tracks that are naming names of people that he stepped with, the album is really good and talks about a lot of stuff that's going on in his life. But, you know, he he's purposely put out these two pieces of hot material, like, you know, about Kim Kardashian and about Sin Santana in order to drive interest. Those are the things that he's done. He's not talked about how, you know, genre defining his music is or how revealing it is or how it's going to be a real personal album. He's spoken about, you know, sleeping with these women who are now in committed relationships or are now... Uh, mothers of children and shit it's just a little bit it's a little bit disgusting for the most part and again like i said i think it's kind of it kind of lends itself to the takashi 69 that girl with the harry styles tattoo on her face it feels like even the justice lament the ju- the juicy slumet guy the one from empire and the kind of you know um did it happen or did it not happen the attack that it, the alleged kind of racist attack that happened to him a uh, racist homophobic attack happened to him in chicago it feels like people are having to do crazy things or to kind of break the noise or to kind of cut through the noise on social media but i also think this assumption that there's a noise on social media is false i think there's always been noise it's always been busy because essentially all these apps we use are free Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, they're free to sign up on. And we got and if you're an artist, if you're an entertainer, you can up your you can upload your stuff on there directly for free too. You can essentially sell your music if you want online for free too if you want to. Um you or for a nominal fee, right? A SoundCloud account is probably eight pounds, right? A month. Uh, you can probably have your stuff listed on Spotify if you email the right people. You can get you can start you can start kind of trading and selling your artistry or getting your stuff out there with a fairly low um, setup cost for the most part, right? So I think there's always been noise. There's always been people out there making noise and, you know, making it kind of a busy uh, marketplace. But I don't think, make it because it's a busy marketplace, you have to then, you know, imagine you it is a busy marketplace and you're selling fruits and you have to kind of come to come in Sunday morning uh, butt naked in order to sell your apples to kind of garner the attention. I don't think that's a, a good long-term strategy because you might get some attention the first couple of weeks, but then after it's going to peter out, then you're going to be the weirdo in the fruit market butt naked s- selling apples no one wants. That's where I think it gets a bit weird. I think people don't realize that actually in the long run, what's actually going to make yourself, what's actually going to make Ghanaian attention is the fact that you're actually making good music. There's people actually care about what you're doing. And I think nowadays, if it feels like, the, especially the older folk and some of the younger folk, the guys in between seem like they've got it figured out, but the younger folk are so desperate to get on because, you know, for them, everything's about likes, everything's about followers that they'll do anything. And the older folk think that they're struggling because they're struggling, they're going to be irrelevant or they're, they're ice cold that it's, they're willing to do anything and everything to kind of get in front of the millennials' eyes. And it's just, I just don't think it's worth it in the long run. I think you're going to alienate more people than you're going to get involved in your artistry personally. Um, again, maybe it's going to work for the game. Maybe he's going to be able to achieve his sales targets and go intentionally once, but I just don't think that's going to happen. I don't think if the music is good, I think it will sell itself. If it isn't good, it won't sell itself. Or in general, if time has moved on, because his last album was pretty cool too and it didn't really garner the attention that he wanted either. I don't think... Maybe it's just the fact that your time has moved on or maybe it's the fact that maybe the attention that he wants, he can't garner anymore. And he has to be willing to accept the attention that he gets as being the level that he wants it. For instance, like there was a time in place where Jay-Z was the biggest artist in the world, right? He still is one of the biggest artists, but he doesn't probably garner the same amount of attention that he would have even during the kind of, you know, um, uh, watch the throne days, right? But I think what he's done that's been clever is that he's willing to accept that level of attention that he has as that, that's his lot. He's been very philosophical about how he's positioning hip hop overall. And that's why, by and large, his verses and music he puts out has been fucking spot on because he knows exactly what his place is. He's not trying to be Playboy Carti. He's not trying to be ASAP Rocky. He's not trying to be Kendrick Lamar because that's not his position. He's an elder statesman now. He's making music that sounds like elder statesman music. He's making elder statesman moves and he's garnering elder statesman's attention. And there's not one person that has a bad word to say about him. Do you know what I mean? For the most part, part of people that might have beefed him in the past or are beefing with him currently, subliminally. But I've to, I'm, I'm just not too sure if the game, if this is a long-term good strategy. Again, I just don't think so. Maybe it's going to work. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. And when the album comes out, everyone's going to be like, oh my God, this album's fucking great. But I just don't see it happening for me in the most part. But hey, that's what happens with the game and Joe Biden. And I guess they're going to sort it out one way or the other. Um, what else is next here? da 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 
Bupity, 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 bu oh, Germans don't like contactless pay. Little interesting video that I saw on online um, that kind of, um, you know, was very, um, that made a lot of sense to me, having been in, in Berlin and Germany a few times. Um, it's weird because whenever you go abroad, right, especially, especially when I went to South America, when I went to Central South America to visit my friend um, when she was living in Nicaragua and I went to Mexico City for a bit as well with a brunette to visit her friend. I realized quite quickly that, you know, we take we take for granted how often we use card payments here or contact us in the UK or in Europe, right? We take it for granted because our places that you go to, they honestly, usually, mostly use cash. And I think in the last few years, my tradition, my kind of like uh, routine when I've kind of booked a holiday, you know, after you've done the whole air, you've done the whole flight thing, you've got your Airbnb. One of my kind of main routines to do was to kind of like scour the net and look for the best exchange rates, right? And kind of get, go and go and convert some money, right? That was kind of the fun of it, right? When we went to uh, Bali, kind of getting, you know, uh, going and finding out the currency they use there and getting that cash and seeing how weird it looked and all that sort of malarkey. That was part of the fun. Then a few years, then a few years later, as time progressed, you start to get a bit complacent. So I think, you know what, fuck, I can just go and I can just go uh, go and get a travel card. Or then when you get a good bank or when I upgraded my bank account, I was able then to kind of use my card internationally wherever I went, especially if I, if I gave them notice beforehand so they didn't block my card. So then you start thinking, oh, I can just use my card in places. But then when you go to certain places, they don't have any card payments. And Berlin is a good example of it. Most places don't accept card, right? Or they prefer you to give cash. I'm not sure it's because of, I'm not sure it's because of the tip economy, because most places in Europe still allow people to give tips, so you know it's better to get tips in cash, or whether it's just in general there's a bit of a hesitation in using um, card payments. But by and large, Germany, whenever I've been to Berlin, really is keen on having people take out cash, and you know it's it's okay in Berlin because similar to London, there's cash points literally everywhere to use. There's ones in nearly every single spetty or off license you might go to. But this little video kind of talks about it a little bit more. Um, it's called uh, "How to Do with Money Like a German," and it's featured on DW News. I'll quickly play a little bit now, and then we'll continue. <laughs> in Germany. The coins clinking together. Slang word for money. Pinky, yep. pinky. Pinker, pinker really is a German slang word for money. It apparently comes from the sound of coins clinking together. Pinker, pinker. And that's a sound you'll hear a lot in Germany. Because here, cash is still very much king. Which is interesting because I think um, in, I think it's a Scandinavian country. I've got which one it was. It might be Sweden, I think. The main city centre in Stockholm, I think for the most part, is 90% cashless. And I think they're trying to make it 100% cashless by 2020. Um, so contact has paid nearly everywhere and they've kind of moved away from the cash um, from the cash economy. Um, in the UK, it's not the same. I think for the most part, if you give someone a tip, they're quite grateful. It's not something that happens quite often. Um, they don't necessarily have the same sort of tipping culture. And most places do have card payments, even little street food marketplaces. Like if you go to the curb. Um, so I spell uh, K E R B. That's in, usually I'm thinking King's Cross, and have a few other places. They do like a street food, um, street food trucks and stuff. Most of those things have like little eyes little um POSs that you can pay with card for the most part. Um, most of the pop up shops you'll go to will still allow you to pay card because they'll do it because most people always use card in the UK. It's a very strange thing that you see here. You don't really see people carrying cash at all, if anywhere. And I've kind of wanted to do the whole cash thing because I've seen. Especially when I've read stuff about financial independence and getting your budgeting into into order, one tip I remember someone mentioning was that you should take out cash up after you pay out all your bill payments, rent, um, bills, all that sort of stuff. Everything that comes out automatically through direct debit in your account, you should then take out everything else in cash, whether it's travel money, whether it's week spending money, whether it's food money. You should have it all in different envelopes and have that to spend, and then kind of then then you can save a bit more easier. Then you can have like your money left over for the month. You can see where you are and then put that into savings. And I've kind of wanted to do that for a long time. But again, it's quite difficult when you go out with mates because then you're the only one that have cash and then they ask you to lend the cash so they can send you the card. But it gets a bit messy overall, but let's continue. Nearby countries like the Netherlands and Sweden are edging ever closer to becoming cashless societies. But in Germany, three quarters of all transactions are still made using notes and coins. On average, Germans carry around more than 100 euros in cash. And it's little wonder, lots of restaurants, shops and ticket machines still don't accept card payment here. Even yeah, that's the thing. So it's not like they um you it's not like um they have the machines. They don't have any machines except card. It's all cash. Which is insane, right? Thinking about it. Like they don't accept any cash for the most part in most places that you go to. 
Like all of it is card, 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 card. But I said, luckily, most places have cash points where you can take out some money. Less than mobile payment technology is slowly creeping into the country. Most people just seem to ignore it. So this woman's asking uh, random people in the street. Um, uh, she's holding up a symbol. The contact is paid. That kind of like wave symbol. And she's asking them, what does this symbol, what does this symbol or credit card, debit card mean to you? One person says, no idea. Another one, it looks, well, it looks like sound waves. <laughs> Another one says, it's something you hold to a card machine and your pin signifying anything. So, have you ever tried it? No. No, not yet. I still prefer to pay with cash. Why? Because then I feel like I'm not giving away my data. Credit cards and debit cards, I don't like all that. I would pay with my mobile phone. It's too insecure. It depends on the amount I'm paying and where I am. The Germans are still too wary. That includes me. <laughs> it's very conservative when it comes to money. I'll be sticking to cash. The fact is, most Germans value security and data privacy over convenience. And that's not particularly surprising, given the country's not-so-distant history of state surveillance. And if you watch Deutschland 86, Deutsch, Deutschland 83 and Deutschland 86, it's on Amazon Prime. It's a really amazing TV series um, centred around the, before the fall, uh, pre and post-fall of the Berlin War. It talks about this guy that kind of acts as a spy, um, who kind of acts as a bit of a double agent um, for the, to the east and the west um, of, of Berlin. And it's an amazing TV series. It kind of documents all the history that went into it. It's amazing because I didn't know they, they practiced state surveillance prior to that time, but there was a lot of that, a lot of fobbing of people that were kind of getting in books from East Germany and back and forth, whatever it may be. So that kind of whole area, and loads of people actually died off the back of it, right? Went to prison for life and all that sort of stuff. So they, they take that very, very seriously. So um, with that, that's probably why a lot of the reason why they don't really like um, the idea of credit cards there because people can easily trace where you are and where you're going to. And even, even the kind of cards that you use to go to, what's Call it. Um, for the most part, everyone uses the you know the tickets for the trains and stuff. They're all paper. They don't have like Oyster card stuff, right? Um, for the most part, people don't really use them. Even though you can sign up for them, they don't. They prefer to have the little paper ticket thing. Whereas we have Oyster cards, we have uh, Apple Pay. So essentially, anyone can find out exactly where you're going throughout the whole day or week or where you've been and where you're going to, based solely on your uh, geolocation. Despite refusing to step into the 21st century in terms of payment innovation, there's no denying that Germany is a financial success story. Which is very true. Um, I recommend you check that out. I'll probably the whole video is so probably a couple of minutes I left anyway in general, but you can check that out. I'll link it in the show notes for those of you that are interested. Da, 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 da. I think that might be it, you know. What's that's an hour, right? Yeah, it's an hour. That's an hour, man. That whizzed by super quickly. Loads of stuff I got through. Um, next one will be tomorrow, so more stuff to get through there. Thank you so much for tuning into Agus Snow's English Show. Or as per usual, it's been a pleasure to have the um the company of your ears and your eyes for those of you watching on YouTube. Um, as I mentioned previously, if you want more information regarding me and DJ gigs and stuff, check my website out, xnozinga.com, which is in the show notes. I'm playing this Friday in Dawson and on Saturday again. On Dawson, you can check out all the listings on DJ gigs on my website. Uh, but apart from then, and until tomorrow, wishing you the best Tuesday ever. Um, see you again very soon. Peace.